ancient religion that promises a path to enlightenment. If he beats you or has sex with you, he's actually uh, opening the way to enlightenment. But will the betrayal of a sacred trust cast shadows on Buddhism's growing popularity? I do think the shame factor uh, has prevented it from being talked about until now, and it's time to be talked about. Buddhism began when a man named Siddhartha Gautama, later known as the Buddha, sat under a tree more than 2,000 years ago until he reached enlightenment. Among his teachings are moral precepts to guide others on their path. They call for purity of mind and self-restraint, call for followers to not harm others and never take sexual advantage of them, advice followed rigorously by most devotees. As Buddhism reached into the West, new followers sought the old knowledge of Tibetan teachers or lamas to guide them on the path to spiritual awakening. For many of us, Tibetan lamas were quite simply the most impressive people we'd met. Who do not have such a great fortune. Speak or act with a pure mind, and happiness will follow. Sogyal Rinpoche is one of the most famous Buddhist lamas. He had a starring role in Bernardo Bertolucci's film, Little Buddha, and has a best-selling book to his name, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. His title, Rinpoche, literally means Precious One. He's a very good speaker, a good charisma, a good vocabulary, English vocabulary, a sense of humor, and uh, it was always nice to, to, to see him acting. Guy, a former Air France pilot, gave all his spare time and considerable money to support the teachings of Soigel Rinpoche. Eventually, his daughter Mimi followed him into Soigel's world. If you're very close to him, you're considered to be a, uh, have a very good karma, and there is a, a competition to, to prove that somehow, that, that you have this closeness. It didn't take long before Soigal noticed Bimi and invited her into his inner circle of followers as a personal assistant, into a circle of young women who catered to all the master's needs. Uh, we are allowed into that circle when we've shown that we're ready to do absolutely everything. At this Buddhist center in France, Mimi worked around the clock until one day the relationship changed. We were going out to a restaurant to celebrate a birthday. So I would coordinate all of that. So there was this moment where I was alone in, the, in his room with him. And then he said, uh, undress. And having been only for two months working as an attendant for him, I, um, uh, I just considered it to be another test of devotion. A test of devotion to a lama with a reputation for a style of teaching known as crazy wisdom. In Tibetan Buddhism, a master who possesses this wisdom can use wild and unconventional methods to open students up, methods that can lead to confusion and abuse. Some uh, masters who have uh, this crazy wisdom um, Use, use beating as a way to open your chakras and open you to your enlightenment. So you can be thrown stones at and whatever he hits you is it's a blessing. If he beats you or has sex with you, he's actually uh, opening the way to enlightenment. After that, he very specifically asked me to swear never to speak of it to anyone and uh, to be clear that it is a very beneficial uh, moment for me to have this uh, connection to my master and that uh, uh, anything that I might do against it or if I talk about it would severe this, this connection. That connection is sacred. In some traditions, students take a vow known as Samaya. They promise to follow the master wholeheartedly and never speak of anything that happens between them. It is subverted as a threat that if you break your samaya, you will land up in the Vajra hell for countless aeons and you will burn in the fiery furnace. And there are other things like that as well, like, you know, it's bad for your karma. 
To see the Master not as a human being, but as the Buddha himself, is the source of the highest blessing. The Indian government did not know how to define it. A group of people placed him on the throne, if you want, and gave people what they wanted. The, the first way was to give money, then the other possibility was to give all your time. And the, the third possibility, if you were young and beautiful, was to accept being in the inner circle of the so-called master. He was absolutely, flagrantly promiscuous. Soi Gal Rinpoche came to the West as a refugee after the Chinese invasion of his country, a Tibetan exile in search of a new life. His rise to fame coincided with a time when young Westerners, alienated from their own culture, turned to the religions of the East for answers. Buddhism seemed to be a beacon of light for many of us. It seemed to be unsullied by the sort of problems we associated with our ancestral religions. And all of that caused us to project an enormously beautiful light on Tibetan lamas. It was the purity of Buddhism's vision that New Yorker Victoria Barlow sought as a young woman in the 1970s, only to find herself deeply betrayed by the very teacher who could help her. In 1976, she began a sexual relationship with Soi Gao that lasted for months. It was inconceivable to imagine that this teacher that is supposed to teach me how to be enlightened would just be out for a quick lay. Teachers were supposed to bring her peace of mind. Victoria spent a decade in India and the United States exploring the world of Buddhism to find a way to heal the wounds left from a childhood scarred by sexual abuse. I think that people who are sexually abused or have been victimized are inclined to need spiritual guidance more than other people. So there's a double whammy that the person who's been abused, been victimized, reaches out for spiritual guidance and doesn't know how to trust, or the correct person to trust, and then gets re-victimized. Re-victimized by a young Soi Gao, known as the reincarnation of a Tibetan Lama whom she'd gone to for advice in New York City. As I sat there, he sat next to me and he started like, caressing my cheek and, you know, saying, you're so special, and uh, I didn't know what to think. It was all, like, so incredibly fast and unexpected, and not what I expected of a Tibetan Lama. I just thought, whatever he does, it's a blessing. Just sit there and accept it. If any other man had done that to me, I, I would have just pushed him away. One should not blanketly assume that every Tibetan Lama is out to have as much sex with young women as possible. That's not true. But it's nonetheless a situation in which there are lots of unclarities and lots of room for what we would call abusive behavior. On clarities like whether teachers were monks who had taken vows of celibacy or tantric lamas, laymen who could use sex so that students learn to control their energies and experience desire to overcome it. These relations should be framed within the strictures of Vajrayana Buddhism, but of course human beings being human beings, um, personal interests are very likely to have a role as well. You have a great cultural gap between the understanding of the teacher and the background and the expectations of a student. It was a system wide open to exploitation. In the 70s, Soi Gyal traveled across the United States and met the leading Buddhist Lama in the West, Choi Gyam Trungpa. There were all these women lined up outside his door. The way he described it was um, that he felt like a rock star and that this is how Trupa lived. And he said exactly that he wanted what Trumpa had created, that he wanted to create something just like that. And it was completely plain to me that he saw 
the attention of um, the Buddhist students as groupies. Where did he hit you? On your head? Yeah, on your head, on your face. On your British body. journalist Mary Finnegan has been tracking So Yal Rinpoche off and on for 16 years, seeking out the stories of women who were abused. It is not just journalistic curiosity that drives her, but the knowledge that she played a part in creating a star. I'm one of the people who launched Sogel on his career as a teacher in London um, in 1973, um, when he was very young and very inexperienced. Finnegan became uncomfortable when she realized that Soigal Rinpoche didn't know the teachings very well. And when she saw how he treated women, look out. There was just this continuous stream of seductions. I mean, he didn't even hide it in those days. He was absolutely flagrantly promiscuous. And he would pick girls up, usually vulnerable, needy, and sort of entertain them for a short while, and then dump them. Yet few women came forward with their stories. Victoria tried in the 1990s when another woman known as Janice Doe accused Soigal of sexual abuse, claiming he required her to perform degrading acts to prove her complete devotion and belief in him. But when that lawsuit was settled, silently, out of court, Victoria found others wanted the whole matter brushed away. People fear that if you uh, talk about a Buddhist teacher as being human, that somehow that's not perfect enough. There is a lot at stake. Soigyal is the founder and spiritual director of the Buddhist organization Rigpa, and it's more than 100 centers in 40 countries. Lera Ling in southern France is the crown jewel in Rigpa's vast network with one of the largest temples in the West. Soigyal Rinpoche remains untarnished by scandal. He was placed on the throne by this small group in Cambridge. Then it grew bigger and bigger, and now in such in, uh, in, in a such big position that uh, the Buddhist community is, uh, cannot, cannot do anything against him because he's too big. How can a spiritual master treat women so badly? So then there is an idea also in Tibetan culture that women are second birth, lesser birth. So they're really second class citizen. Then you have the idea that um, Young women, if you have sex with young women, it will give you a longer life. So in a way, you have all these different things come together. And then if you have somebody who thinks he's awakened and everybody tells him he's awakened, then I think it really inflates the ego. What is dangerous is the fact that the students need their teacher to be amazing. So they think the teacher is totally, completely awake. Mimi escaped the physical and sexual abuse after three years in the inner circle. Now, on the outside, she has decided to speak out, to offer an alternative view of the Rinpoche and explain how women get drawn in. It's a bit similar to this Stockholm Syndrome. You know, you're locked up in this tiny environment where someone is beating you up every day, but it's also the person who's giving you the only emotional attention and the, and the actual food and the roof, yeah? Getting out came at a cost. Mimi slowly built stronger connections to the outside world until she felt able to walk away. But once out, she felt threatened and for years blocked details of what had happened. Finally, after months of illness, she decided she needed to confront Sogyal. I went with my lawyer and I confronted him by giving him a drawing, a drawing that was explicit about what my experience had been. She has all her journals from her time as a member of the inner circle and her memories. And she is drawing and writing about that time, trying to exercise the chill she still lives with. I feel very sad because I just remember me having uh, lost myself and being in a group of, of particularly other girls, other young girls who uh, lost themselves even more because I don't see them coming back to themselves today. Despite growing suspicions about the master, Mimi's father had no personal knowledge of sexual abuse until he learned what had happened to her. Even then, he gave 
gave the master a chance to explain. I'm a, an airline pilot and I want things to be extremely rigorous. I went to Sogal and asked him directly what, what happened and what he did and why was he doing that and so on. He did not deny what I was asking. I asked him a few details about condoms and so on, but uh, it was confirmed. Then I decided to leave and uh, to help uh, the victims. Mimi and Guy aren't the only ones breaking their silence. Several Canadians left retreats at Le Rebling because of Sogial's behavior. They came from this Rigpa Centre in Montreal. When Denise Saint-Hubert made her plans to leave known, Sogial called her in for a talk. I told him I found it unacceptable to choose vulnerable young Western women, neophytes to the Dharma, to perform so-called initiation practices that were sexual in nature. He then responded, it is the young girls that request it. Denise wrote a letter copied to the Dalai Lama complaining about Soigel. She did not receive a response from him. Scandals in the Tibetan and the Zen traditions are surfacing, and the Dalai Lama does know some teachers are sexually abusing their students. In 1993, he convened a meeting with Western Buddhist teachers to talk about a handful of teachers who were ignoring the basic precepts of the faith. In an open letter, they wrote that students should confront those teachers and, if necessary, out them. Stephen Batchelor was present at those meetings. The Dalai Lama, in the end, refused to endorse the open letter. So, in a way, I think, it didn't serve a great deal. Buddhism's growing popularity owes much to the Dalai Lama, a Tibetan monk seen as the religion's de facto leader, but in reality just the head of one branch. Even though he has little authority, some believe he should speak up. So far, he hasn't. Here on a visit to Toronto, heavy security protects him against the very real threats to his safety. But it is the security of secrecy that protects the cause of Tibetans in exile and the religion from being destroyed by scandal. It is that secrecy that has so far protected Sogyal Rinpoche. The Tibetans close ranks around him. I mean, he's got the Dalai Lama stardust sprinkled all over him because the Dalai Lama conducted the opening ceremony of the Le Rebling Temple in France. And, you know, they all endorse him, they all validate him. Soigal Rinpoche and officials at Rigpa declined our request for an interview. Instead, Rigpa issued a statement that reads in part, Any allegations of inappropriate behavior are taken very seriously by us. We have full confidence in the sincerity and authenticity of Soigal Rinpoche as a Buddhist teacher. But then you continue to say, may all others also Sogyal Rinpoche not, not only abused the women under his control, he abused Buddhism itself, a religion with much to offer the West. His victims came seeking a compassionate way out of suffering. Instead, he gave them greater suffering. You have this guilt that you feel, so you fight yourself to not hear those voices of, this is crazy, this is unheard of. Uh, being betrayed by a spiritual teacher is the theft of a belief system, you know, how one exists as a human being. It, it hurt me to the core. Victoria Barlow no longer believes that speaking out will send her to hell, but not telling the truth about Soigyal Rinpoche's abuse of women might. She believes it is the only way to save Buddhism in the West. I do think the shame factor uh, has prevented it from being talked about until now. And it's time to be talked about. And it's okay if it's talked about. I don't think that is going to destroy what is important and significant about Buddhism. I think, in fact, it'll make it much better. Teachers like Stephen Batchelor see a need for Buddhism to return to its roots, to avoid the charisma of gurus and all the potential for abuse. The Buddha never uses the word guru. So I think the Buddha, were he alive today, um, would be rather puzzled, to put it mildly, at how authority has shifted from simple allegiance to the Dhamma or the teaching to a complete identification with a human teacher.